Hey everybody, it's Micah Mitchell with Membarium, and I'm excited to have Kyle Newton of Tribe Hub. Kyle, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, my friend. Thanks for joining, uh, having me join you today. I appreciate it. Yeah, man, I'm excited. Um, we caught up a little bit ago, but I wanted to actually record um, some questions with you because I feel like you're kind of in the mix of things doing stuff. And so um, let's start off by, you know, there there is another interview with you that kind of covers your backstory and some of your other things. So yep. for those of you watching, if you don't know Kyle, you can go check that out. Um, I'll just jump into it. So in 2022, um, what were you doing as it relates to memberships and courses and all that kind of stuff? Well, I mean, you know, really the same thing I've been doing for the past 20 years <laughs> or 22 years, but, you know, really heads down on a lot of enterprise level clients, you know, continuing to work with clients, scaling enterprise to me is anyone with a hundred thousand contacts up to 1 million plus. And so we've got several clients like that that just, keep us really busy. Uh, my children, my two adult children have come in and started working inside the business over the past two, two and a half years. And so 2022 was a, a year of systems for us, developing a lot of internal systems to really streamline our process. And then we've been developing, we're at about 12 proprietary plugins now across the Buddy Boss, Gammy Press, Gravity, uh, space, everything to do with membership. So a lot of custom development in the sense of plugins, a lot of systems and the way that we work with our clients and process our clients and really uh, try to give excellent customer service experience all the way through and really just having a good time. I mean, it's, it has been such a wonderful time uh, having my kids on board into the business. They've always been on the media side and a little bit on the marketing side, but now they're completely under the hood and that's been a lot of fun. That's cool. That's cool. So uh, when you talk about custom plugins, that catches my attention. Um, can you give us an example or two of some of those? Why did you develop something custom? Well, there's multiple reasons of doing that. And, and I simply mean custom in the sense that it makes a whole lot more sense for a lot of the things that we do to be built into a plugin format versus constantly, you know, adjusting functions on PHP or, you know, moving stuff into the child theme or whatever it may be so that we could deploy it. Because a lot of these things are common to a lot of my clients. I really niche niche into the Buddy Boss area. Just about every one of my clients want a social community. So Buddy Boss is a big part of pretty much 90% of my deployments now are Buddy Boss, Learn Dash, Mimarium, Gravity, Elementor, you know, as a core stack, then any number of other plugins, whether it's an affiliate plugin or, you know, whatever that may be. And inside of Buddy Boss, there's a member card in the member directory. And one of the custom plugins we did was to really customize that member card so that it can display certain information beyond what the Buddy Boss defaults to. Uh, it can show tags as badges, basically, Mimbarium tags or whatever CRM tags, but Mimbarium tags, you know, as badges, it can show and display all the different profile, t uh, bro profile fields across the profile sets inside of Buddy Boss. It can actually add an icon. And the reason that's important is we have a second Buddy Boss a custom tool that we made, which is kind of a personality assessment uh, in the sense of think DISC or think Meyer Briggs or think, you know, what token character are you? I have a lot of my clients who want to use those quiz type assessments as lead gen, meaning uh, I've got a uh, client called The Future School and they have uh, an arts assessment, adaptive, resilient, transformative. And so you go through, you take a 21 gravity quiz uh, quiz <laughs> and you come out knowing whether you're adapter resilient transformative what your score in each one of those is and then we put a little icon in the member profile card that displays that and then you can search via other members uh, across different groups and or the member directory according to that assessment results which creates a higher degree of an engagement especially when that assessment is used in a critical way in the coaching consulting or education process that they're doing so those are the buddy boss ones i'll pause there if you want any feedback on that otherwise i can talk about the gamification ones we've been building as well yeah i'm intrigued by a lot of that stuff so um I, I understand the use of a custom plugin, like you're saying, to be to be able to create um, a, a greater profile. But I like that where you're saying it's going to create a extra level of engagement mm -hmm. by having these. I would call them outside constructs, almost applied to the membership. Um, so can you put it in context of a site? So like, let's say they're using one of these profile things and then they are they proactively connecting people? How do they get people to, let's say, reach out to one another? 
That's really great, gr really great uh, question. And by the way, when I make these plugs, when I say custom, one of my rules with all of my developers, and I've got multiple development teams, is if it can be done by another top level plugin like Membarium, like Gravity, like Buddy Boss, like Learn Dash, let those plugins do what they do. And then we just put the custom layer of whatever types of interfaces or like the assessment calculation or whatever that may be. So these are all just add-on plugins on top of other plugins. They're not a full standalone because we use gravity and there's a lot of theory behind that and, and, and why I'm doing it that route. But to give you a customer example, I'll go all the way back to uh, TSFX as an example, the future school. They're about to embark on a pretty aggressive advertising campaign to reach out to their target market. So they're going to go out and they're going to target with Facebook ads, other people and other groups and audiences that are into futures thinkings or future studies. Uh, I could get all off into what that means because I really love the client, but regardless, it's just futurists, people who are thinking about changing the future, planning the future, mapping the future. And when you think about futures studies like that and, and that type of mentality, those people want to discover what their skill sets are. It's a very uh, intangible, very kind of heady type field. And so the more that they have their potential client base has a framework of who I am in future studies, what my skills are, and then how I can apply that as a coach or consultant with the organizations that I'm serving, the better that they're serving their clients. So the art assessment really does two different things. Number one, it becomes a lead generation tool because it's intuitive. They can run an ad, find out what type of leadership style you are in the area of future studies. If I'm a person who's been studying futures or futures thinking or foresight, natural foresight or strategic foresight, those are all theories and structures and people consult in that. If I'm scrolling through Facebook, Instagram, whatever, TikTok, and I see an ad that's gonna teach me more of how to be good at strategic or natural foresight and give me a personality assessment or a skills assessment for free, then I'm gonna click on that. So that ad's gonna be in some form of social feed. They're gonna click on it and it's gonna be a free to take assessment. It jumps straight into the assessment. They click through the 21 questions. At the end, they just have to put in their first name, their last name and their email, right? You know, from that standpoint to see the results. Well, what are we gonna do with that? We're gonna pump that through Membarium. We're gonna auto log them in. We're gonna set all their tags in the CRM. And based on those tags, we're gonna give them a dynamic displayed result screen that based on the tags of what assessment profile are they, we're gonna display a specific graphic and so forth and so on. So it's a lead generation up to that point. And then from there, like we were talking about with the member card, we display it. It becomes a profile field in their Buddy Boss profile. It becomes displayed on their membership card as well and on their public and personal profile. It automatically enrolls them into a group for example, an adaptive group or resilient group and a transformative group where the client is going to specifically coach, mentor and train people with that leadership style and how to apply that leadership style to their coaching and consulting. Their clients are large companies that want to apply it, but more importantly, the professionals, the coaches, consultants, or internal employees, they're actually applying natural foresight and strategic foresight. And so what's happening is you'll come in and learn more about your style and how your style serves you and serving your organization. And then what we do is we create groups of working with others. What I mean by it is, is how do you work with leaders who are resilient if you're adaptive? How do you work with leaders that are transformative if you're adaptive? And so it kind of branches off in two ways. How do you learn more about yourself and how do you learn more more about working with others and it makes its way into that group and then what also happens based on that is we give them recommended resources and we've created what we call recipes which are all of these methods it's kind of like a recipe book where they based on if you're adaptive you have these certain of recipes that are useful for you in your consulting versus recipes if you're resilient or transformative i love it so i think you alluded to this earlier in one of your streams of consciousness there about how all of this is even more powerful if it's kind of worked into the curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, I know one of the case studies I did recently, they did a good job of like, hey, here's our framework and our concept. And then pretty much everything was organized into those areas. And mm -hmm. the assessment basically put them on a map and said, here you go. But what you're saying sounds a little bit more dynamic, uh, or at least that it's not, you know, uh, linear. It's mm -hmm. more, there's multiple groups. And then not only go into your correct group, but you're saying, here's how to interface with others and all that sounds so cool. Um, so what's another, so that was one example of a custom plugin. What other custom things, um, do you do besides plugins? Meaning are you doing, do you use a plugin to, to create custom design or are you doing themes or anything, you know, on the design side? Nothing really on the design side outside of, of course, the UX that the, um, uh 
that the plugin would uh, you know change the u user experience, but it's not themes. We don't go that large because we're mainly staying inside the Buddy Boss theme, or if we're on a Astra theme or whatever that may be. So we haven't graduated to the theme level yet because the themes that we're using are really uh, you know serving us. The main things that we focus in beyond that are gamification plugins. Um, we've got a lot of Gammy Press add-ons. And then we've been developing our own gamification plugins based on Membarium and based on tags. We've done that for two reasons. One, because we have large enterprise level clients, no offense to Gammy Press and no offense to whatever, but it's a resource. It's a pretty heavy resource hog that along with like WooCommerce memberships and whatnot, because we run a large uh, enterprise platforms, we really look at the resource hog plugins and we have to kind of steer away from those. Now, probably 60, 70% of my clients have Gammy Press. The smaller clients, I recommend Gammy Press because it's very simple to use and it's great. But for our larger clients, we they already are running Membarium. They're already running a CRM and Gammy Press is just really eating up the server bandwidth. We're having to scale up to multiple AWS, Elastic servers and other things. And our server admins, you know, we've got a phenomenal server team. You know, they're just like, you know, 60, 70% of the data database is Gammy Press just chewing away. And, and I reached out to Ruben and they're like, yeah, you know, cause his WP automator is not written in the same way Gammy Press is. He's like, yeah, we don't plan on upgrading anytime soon. So with that in mind, we had to build our own gamification framework on top of Membarium and the CRM framework basically because tags we're, we're monitoring and we're setting tags pretty much at all the same achievement points that we would set with Gammy Press, like completed a course, completed a lesson, updated your profile, did this, did that. We're setting tags anyway, because we have a very sophisticated uh, dashboard, engagement dashboard. And so we either on our Gammy Press deployments, we're reaching into Gammy Press database and pulling that data in, or for the non Gammy Press, we're reaching back into the CRM and creating those dashboards. And we're just using, uh, we're using the, uh, the tags to do that. So we basically classify and taxonomy certain tags for ranks, achievements, points, things like that. Use tags to drive all of that. And since Membarium is running under the hood anyway, and it's a, it's a high performance uh, plugin. It doesn't slow things down. We're able to really, you know, accomplish a full gamification build out just using CRM and tags. So, so let's talk about this for people out there. They might be somewhere on that spectrum, right? They, they are not so big yet that something like Game of Press is going to hold them back. So maybe That's it's right. a, it's a good first step. What's that mm -hmm. transition like? So if they start on something and then they later think, oh man, I'm, I'm growing, I have success, which is great, but now I have these other problems of scalability. Is it difficult to transition that into something? Do they lose historical data? No, we're actually doing this right now. As you know, Neurogym is one of our clients, John Osroff, which has kind of some inception genesis points with Membarium as well, and, and David and so forth and so on. We're, we are transitioning from Gammy Press, I think next week. Uh, is when the final process is going to be in place. All we did was do an export out of, uh, number one, we already had some tag data that corresponded because we started laying on the tag data early. Uh, but then there's still some historic data before we started implementing tags inside of Infusionsoft using Membarium. Um, we have, we just export our user earnings uh, database. Yeah, Gammy Press has an export. We map that to tag data and then we backfill that tag data into the contact record. And then we have both UIs running side by side, the Gammy Press UI and the custom UI based on tags. And we just, once we want to make the switch over, we'll turn off the Gammy Press plugin. We backfilled the CRM with the proper tag data. The new UX is in place and we're ready to go. So, so let's dig into that for a sec. That's awesome. And it just, it's funny that you mentioned that. Cause I, I remember switching that company over to Membarium and doing the same mm -hmm. thing where created a staging site, created the new site with Membarium, and then basically compared them until they were close enough that it's like, okay, switch the domain to point over here now. Right. Um, That's right. so for, for people out there who want to go through some sort of transition like that, any sort of tips on, uh, how do you. How do you switch like from one host to another, from one CRM to another? Because I'm sure you do a lot of this transition work. So just generally speaking, what comes to mind as far as tips for people who need to transition? Um, there's multiple ways we do it. Like, for example, with Neurogym, we're actually doing it on the same live site. Now, obviously, we're doing it in staging, but we're not actually bringing up a staging. We're going to push code. Uh, we have three sets of stagings that they go through before we actually make it to live, but we're developing simultaneously. We're not going to like switch domains. We're just going to actually push the code up and through. Um, and so really it's just 
really error testing from that standpoint, you know, really kind of doing almost exactly what you said, looking at your compares, doing those types of things. And then what we like to do is to be able to bring it into its live environment simultaneously so we can see it to make sure it's living. And then we turn off the old and deprecate the old on the live environment and just switch over to the new. And that what that does, especially with our high performance clients, number one, there's a lot of server savings uh, because the level of server spend that they're doing and traffic and so forth and so on. And it just makes it easier for us to test. So we stand it up on staging, then we stand it up on live, and then we deprecate on staging and we deprecate on live and everything's ready to go. Gotcha. So we're maybe getting a little nerdy for some people, but I'm sure the geeks are loving this. So <laughs> So well, I'm good. actually not a geek. I haven't coded in years. I, well, I guess I am, but I, you know, <laughs> that's about as geeky as I get. Let me put it that way. Yeah, I think you speak the language. It's not your first language, but you know, yeah, seem seem pretty fluent. Um, so let's talk on the marketing side. So we've talked about some plugins, you know, gamification profiles and community and stuff like that. What do you do with this data from a marketing perspective? Are you doing like, you know, personality type based marketing and things like that? To be clear, we we kind of always talk about our, our skill set is not marketing, even though we get dragged into it more often than we want. Um, I've really kind of focused in on, you know, there's lead generation, lead conversion, lead fulfillment. Marketing and sales are typically at the lead generation area. And while we have deep experience in that, I don't really like getting into that because it's least predictable amount of results, right? It takes a lot of research, a lot of testing to really dial in your ROIs and your KPIs and all of those types of things. And, you know, uh, what we realized is that lead conversion is extremely predictable and lead fulfillment is highly predictable. What I mean by that is we're running ads or we're, we, we, a handful of clients, we help them run their ads. We actually help them create what we call shareable stories, you know, out on Facebook and do some things like that. And then we measure those metrics all the way from all of the ad data and the ad set data all the way through. If they're using some, some of them use click funnels, some of them use cart flows or whatever it may be, you know, to really track conversions of sales, cross sales and bumps as you're coming through. And we're tracking all of that data, feeding it into a custom uh, dashboard. What we found in the WordPress ecosystem is that there's not a dashboard that allows you to see across all plugins outside of the plugin, outside of the platform and inside the platform. So we have what we call the Gamplify Engagement Dashboard that starts and actually pulls in that Facebook metric data or whatever your ad metric data is, goes all the way through your lead conversion process, i.e. your sales conversion into your initial onboarding, and then goes all the way into lead fulfillment, which is the long tail of the experience on the platform. And so those are some of the things, obviously we have the assessment tools out there that we talked about. We have a whole digital publishing arm that we publish books digitally and, and publish them on the websites and app form. We have a lot of these tools that we use to really be out there in the lead generation side of it all. And then we really take it from there with our dashboards and our measuring systems and really measure from the lead generation metrics through the lead conversion all the way to lead fulfillment, and of course, churn, you know, on the back end. So with all this custom software that you guys are making, does that become a maintenance problem? Because I know you're kind of doing it for your for your individual clients. You're not necessarily like a software company. How do you manage the the versioning and the maintenance of all that? That's a really good question. If you remember, and if for those listening who care, they could go back and look at my my video. You know, I started back in the year 2000 and between 2000 and 2008, we developed four and a half million lines of code. Back in 2000, you know, you didn't have Facebook or WordPress till 2003, 2004, 2005, right? And so we were developing membership sites before that ex before any of that really existed because we served the network marketing direct sales industry, which was one of the first industries that really needed a centralized membership hub to track content communication community and commerce and training and learning and coaching and mentoring and training and all of that. So we were building early on. So we built our own custom CMS, our own CRM, our own gamification, our own email system, our own billing system, our own replicating system, on and on and on because it just didn't exist. And then finally around 2015, my developers pulled me kicking and screaming into the WordPress ecosystem because I was a very custom, custom minded, right? Custom and just beats everything. And so, but once I kind of dipped my toe into the WordPress ecosystem with a couple of our clients, we just completely transitioned. And between 2015 and 20, really 2020, 
2021, uh, we really had very little custom code. We outside of our legacy clients that we were slowly our, we had our old code base, we're not many lines of code, but we weren't doing any new code inside the WordPress ecosystem because we were learning it. We wanted to. My philosophy is take the the obviously the theme, the plugins, and the WordPress core and take it to its maximum. If it can be done, if content restriction can be done at the elementary level, do it there. If we can do it at the elementary level, if we can do it at the WordPress role level, we always try to do it at its base level and then work our way up. Now, what does that mean? When we talk about we're doing custom plugins and to answer your question about, you know, maintaining the code base related to that, we're only building add-on plugins that fill the gaps like on Membarium, on Gravity, on Buddy Boss, on all of those things. And so it's really small snippets of code Take, for example, our, our gamification that we're building. We're using Gravity Forms to do 80, 90% of it because Gravity is such a robust tool that all we have to do is add a few little gamification elements, a few little weighting elements to it, use Membarium for the tags, which is actually recording the history of what's happening on the platform, tie that together. So it's very small code snippets that we're actually creating because we're leveraging some of these very large code bases and of course we have git and forking and branching and three levels before it gets there and then we push out you know our plugins and so forth and so on so we have a full you know code maintenance process but the code is actually relatively it's definitely not for that much last code you know it is it is a much much smaller code base now so if I'm hearing you, like when you say plug and I think to myself like a full fledged plug in blah 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 um but you're kind of more saying these are really just scripts that we turn into plugins so that they're more maintainable, um, but they're not, they don't have their own core database most of the time they're feeding off of and, and combining from things, right? Only when necessary, only where, when and where the data cannot be stored somewhere else in meta, somewhere else in the database. Uh, we only code and we only store data when it's not somewhere else. That's the rule, right? If it can be stored somewhere else in the contact record, if it can be stored in the user meta, if it can be stored somewhere, most of our things are pulling data from where it already exists, modifying it and displaying it in a UX standpoint. So yes, it's things that you would normally find in the child theme or functions.php or some CSS or whatever. The main reason that we brought it into a plugin is because I'm deploying across hundreds of clients, right? And I don't want to have to, when I update the plugin, have to go and manually make adjustment across multiple clients. I want to use the plugin architecture, right, to continue to maintain versioning. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And for those of you who are not technical to kind of like translate maybe the principles here, and you can help me out, Kyle, as well. Um, with, you know, overall, you want less technology on your site because every single plugin that's on there is being initialized, basically being loaded. It's using server. Um, and and I know within Membarium, for example, we put features in there not because, oh, we're going to go become the best at doing this feature, but more just because so many of our clients had added a plugin just for one little feature that we could throw in with no effort. And therefore, mm -hmm. they have one less plugin, you know. Um, but yeah, what you're saying about, you know, not recreating data, basically, you're not duplicating any work. And I think also then because you're using the source data where it exists, instead of duplicating it, you don't have to worry about syncing it every time a change right. happens to one or the other. So for those of you who aren't nerds, just just kind of checking with your developers and people like that and saying, you know, go back and listen to this exactly what Kyle said. Hey, if it can be done already within current systems and infrastructure somewhere, do it there use your custom things to, to modify or dress it up a little or move it from here to there if necessary, but but don't recreate the wheel. Would you add anything to that? No, that's spot on. It's exactly, and, and I finally kind of got my dev teams trained to that in the sense that developers always want to the default to development. I can just develop this. I can do this quick, quick, quick. But what I what I understand after running four and a half million lines of code for almost a decade and a half is that that's going to get out of date at some point. It's going to move into conflict as WordPress and everything moves on. And I'm going to have to deal with that later down the road when I'd rather put the onus on to these top tier plugins like Gravity, Membarium, Buddy Boss, whatever, because they're going to be constantly updating. And then we just make minimal connections and hooks. We use the data where it resides. And now all of a sudden, my, there's three things that I always try to minimize, both for myself and my clients, risk, complexity, and cost, right? 
If I can decrease complexity because the complexity already exists, then I don't have to take on that complexity. That de-risks my current and my future, my current timeframes of development, my future timeframes of uh, support, and then of course cost. It's less development cost on my side, less development cost to have to pass on to my client. Yeah, and on that note, I would say that is a great reason to not chase shiny objects because sometimes mm -hmm. people will say, well, I really want X to happen. I want a purple star to appear right here, right? Mm -hmm. And then they go down the road of custom developing to get that thing. And it's like, well, you just added complexity, risk, cost, not just today, but down the road, That's you right. know, um, and it's, it, you just got to make sure maybe the purple star is worth it for some businesses, but you got to actually realize the short and long-term technical debt almost, or, or at least um, commitment, right? Um, so let's, I know you're not, you say you're not kind of a, well, you said on lead, you know, lead conversion marketing isn't your thing, but you, you were saying that the conversion process, like the sales and conversion process, you feel that's pretty, you know, something that's predictable. Is that kind of what you were saying? In the sense that the predictable of the execution of it, you know, after hundreds and hundreds of clients over the years, I found that, you know, you know, like, for example, we've got a hundred percent rating on Upwork, you know, we can deliver the platform, the lead fulfillment side with 100% accuracy because it's a very controllable environment. The inputs, the outputs, the dynamics are very controllable. Lead conversion is pretty controllable. If a person comes and hits one of our conversion mechanisms, there's, it is the mechanism is going to work and the percentages are going to work themselves out. Lead generation is where it becomes less predictable because you don't know whether your ads are going to perform or not perform. Is your copy, is your sales, is your audience, all of those types of things. So there's a whole lot more risk and variation into that. And we typically just have other marketing companies take that on. And then we focus on lead conversion. We say, what are you converting at the mouth of your funnel or at the midpoint of your funnel right now? Well, we're at a 20% conversion, 5% conversion, 65% conversion. Okay, great. Let's put a benchmark on that. Let's backfill our dashboard with that historic data so that we have what you're, what we're performing. And now let's change that engagement process because most of my clients are engaging me, not just for the normal mechanics of lead conversion to lead fulfillment. We're actually changing the complete engagement strategy, the UX UI, the gamification, all the way through every piece of the fabric of the platform, whether it's learning, gamification, profile, social, whatever that may be, we're changing all of that. And we've got to measure. We can't just change because it's fun. Going back to the shiny object, we want the baseline of how the site was performing when it came to us. And then the changes that we're making, are we bumping those KPIs from conversion all the way into long tail fulfillment? So when you talk about how you're changing that process, I, I, I think what you're referring to is they might have had before an ad goes to an opt-in goes to a sales video and you're saying no we're going to have an assessment and then a custom experience and then a, that's and that's right. what you're talking about right custom, have, you, yes. have you ever had that backfire where like you do a bunch of work and then it doesn't work and you're like you know or does it always work early on i did because there, obviously there was a learning curve you know after it's kind of one of the it's the malcolm Gladwell, you know ten thousand hours i'm at like twenty five thousand hours into this now you know you just eventually kind of know what works and doesn't work and you don't have that many misfires where the misfires happen is again at the lead generation because you just don't know if you're communicating properly the right offer and all of those types of things so um do we totally fail no there's times that there are certain elements that we don't predict it's like ah we took a hit there it was too confusing it was too many steps they didn't understand the story arc that we we're trying to bring people into and we missed it right and they got lost and they got stuck but what we have in our dashboard is what we call a red light yellow light green light system each one of these steps that we expect a, a new member to go through, we have a certain amount of time frame from the moment they entered the conversion process, we set a time limit. And if they are going past a certain time, it, it triggers a yellow light in the dashboard. Then it triggers a red light if they're going way behind. And those are early indicators that we utilize and measure those metrics to make sure that you know we see those roadblocks changing much earlier than further down the line at the churn like oh a year later we, we you know we see it immediately because we're timing it by days and hours you know this yellow light and red light system hmm. this is interesting i can't wait till we do some case studies and, and get to see some of these things um i have one or two last questions one of them is so you're talking a lot about user experience and all mm -hmm. that what would you say are some of your best strategies if you come into a company and they're like oh yeah we're, we're selling these memberships all day long but we're not retaining members 
Um, what are some strategies for retention? Uh, it's really, I don't mean to be so boring about it, but it's really the same process that we've been talking about today. It's developing that onboarding process. For example, what I start with typically, if we see a high churn ratio, like for example, I won't mention the client's name, but we're working with a, a kind of a Christian discipleship organization right now, right? And and they're very much into that, that standpoint of it. And they're doing phenomenal, like crazy phenomenal on the lead generation side of it all. And for the first 30 days, there's a pretty decent amount of engagement, but then there's this tremendous fall off off the back end after 30 days. And so um, we're trying to fix that. That's literally like I worked with this client a year ago, install their gamification. Then they came back to me a year later, like, okay, we really it, not, they weren't pointing at the gamification we did. They're like, you know, I've been really studying now and now I see, I need these things and we need you to come in and help us take it to the next level. So we're on a pretty large engagement with them over the course of this year, 2023, to really solve this problem. We started in November. Um, what we're doing is we're starting, I, I, every time I do engagement, I start with a concept called epic meaning and calling. What I mean by that is, what is the story that they're telling their members as they come into this funnel? Uh, she calls her, you know, you, you know, uh, Russell, you know, started the whole challenge concept, right? She calls her challenges revivals. It's it's a three day webinar, three days worth of webinars, so forth and so on, because as this Christian overtone, she's calling them revivals. And what I do is I've gone in and I've created a 25 page document where I've documented her complete user journey from start to finish. And I've looked at what she's communicating to them through that whole process. What touch points is she having or her member specialist having throughout the process? And then we've been polling and taking polls of what the, the different members of different member levels think about and what they see as valuable and not valuable. And then we take all of that data and we change the story from the moment they come into that revival. What are we telling them? How are we communicating to them about this experience and this journey they're about to take? And then we reinforce that journey with the user experience, with prompts, with experiences, with changes in the UX, whether it's gamification or the way they engage with other members or other members are engaging with them and the incentive strategies to make all of that happen. So it, it's, it's a long process that we do. It's typically a 50 to 100 hour process that I spend going through over the course of 60 days or so multiple calls to really lay out that story arc, then we change the story, then we change the UX UI to mirror that story, then we use our dashboards to measure those changes all the way through the process. So this is, it sounds large scale, like it's a big long-term project and it sounds like they have enough people that it's totally worth that level of detail. What would you do for a site that had, let's say 200 members, um, mm -hmm. you know, but their churn is high, what level of what you said, like, how would you engage that? Is it like, hey, man, you need a day, you need three days, you and your team need to get together for a week? Like, what what would be maybe appropriate to a 200 member site? That's a great process. I, I don't really have a scale for that right now, uh, but we're in the process of developing that scale, meaning we're developing what we're doing behind my, I have tripub.com and we're developing, we're, we're using our own tools to help ourselves in the sense that we are in the process of creating our own membership site. I've literally not had my own membership site for 22 years. I've only built it for other people. So we're finally building our own so that we can actually have those price points where it's kind of a DIY process. They're going to be able to come on, on board, go through courses and kind of do it themselves where I'm teaching these kind of practices I'm telling you today uh, and they're going through learning and then they're immediately logging into their platform and making those changes in Buddy Balls or making those changes in Membarium or making those changes in their UX and then they're testing and then they're using our tool set to kind of DIY and then if they ever want to DIY, do it yourself versus done for you, you know, from that standpoint. So that's the way that we're currently doing it. I, because it's so intensive, this is one of the bottlenecks being very transparent. As my kids have come in, they're like, we've got to systemize this because it's it's very intensive, the consulting process you bring to your clients. How do we bottle any part of that and make it where we can serve more people? And so we're working on that. Ah, uh, so now, now you got to do the magic trick for the magicians. Uh -oh. That's right. That's correct. I've got to put my own consultant's hat on for myself. It's sometimes hard to physician, oh, that physician, heal thyself, right? You know, it's a little bit hard, but we're, I'm doing my best to kind of look at myself through my own lens. It's a fun challenge though. Um, and that's that's a perfect lead in. Well, I'll ask one more question and, mm -hmm. and then um, let's talk more about the Tripub thing. Um, what's something I should have asked or you think would be interesting for an audience of, of higher level membership site owners? The main thing that I would do, 
here's the heartache is that really think through your tech team. You know, it, it, the number one thing that's a heartache for me is when clients come to me and they've started down a path and they've they've laid in a wrong foundation and now we've got to retool it. You talked a little bit about that before. Uh, you know, how do you lay in the right foundation? What happens when you have to transition? You know, we've dealt with those transitions, but as a site owner, really think about your consultants and who's advising you uh, from that standpoint, because you know some of these decisions are a little bit harder, a little bit costier, costlier to make. And that's not advertising for me. I, I would I would recommend I've worked with multiple of your partners listed on the Midbarium site, hired multiple of them, including some of the other certified partners, and you know I would recommend any of those that are out here on the Midbarium platform uh, and get the right people advising you. That's the number one thing. Uh, you only you know it's better to start with a solid foundation and I encourage people to really look at it invest the money and the time to get the right advice so that you're building on the right foundation in the right direction it'll save you tons in the future when you do it right off the beginning yeah that's gold because an advisor that you trust you know can lead you in the wrong direction you know even meaning well so yeah mm -hmm. I, I I love that um so thanks Kyle for you know sharing your knowledge and um, mm -hmm. a lot of these higher level things uh, how was the best way for somebody to engage with you if they have a question or if they want to, you know, hire you or, or just ask about some of the things you've said? Absolutely. Uh, my website is tribepub.com, T-R-I-B-E-P-U-B.com. Platform Unified Business is what we create, tribepub.com and reach me right there. Awesome, man. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for the invitation, Mike. I appreciate it.